the fourth book on the Word of God. So if you would uh, open that up and we will go through it. And please remember as we go through that if the verse has an eyeball next to it, then uh, it's intended that we look these verses up. If it has a key next to it, then uh, the verse is uh, probably right there in the text and we can read it from the booklet. So you follow along as I read. I'll make a few comments here and there. Uh, there's one typo in this book that I'll ask you to correct in your booklet. That's on page three. But let's jump right in here. First of all, the Bible is unlike any book. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right. It is the only book that answers man's three basic questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? These questions cannot be answered by just any book. Before opening the Bible in search of these answers, let's first learn more about the Bible. So the first big question here, what are the basic contents of the Bible? The Bible is a collection of 66 books. In Luke 24, 44, this is Jesus talking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, and he said, all things, now don't forget, at this point, there is no New Testament. The only Bible that existed at this point on earth was the Old Testament. And Jesus said, all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Now, that takes into view the entire Old Testament. That's the Old Testament, the, the law and, the, and poetry and the prophets. The 39 Old Testament books were written before Jesus Christ's birth, and the 27 New Testament uh, books were written afterward. So uh, we, we just looked at this last year, but it won't hurt us to hear it again, that the 39 Old Testament books are in five groups. First, the Law of Moses. Genesis through Deuteronomy. Second, the books of history, Joshua through Esther. Then the books of poetry, and that would be Job through the Song of Solomon. And then the prophets, and when we talked about it, I gave you one group called the prophets, but truthfully, it's more accurately broken down into major prophets, which is Isaiah through Daniel, and minor prophets, which are Hosea, through Malachi. So those are the five sections of the Old Testament. Then the New Testament has 27 books, and they are in five groups. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John comprise the Gospels. The book of Acts is a book of the history of the early church. Now here's where the, the uh, misprint is. It says Romans through Philippians. Cross out Philippians and write Philemon, P H I L. E-M-O-N. And maybe if you have a, do, is that the same in yours? Oh, oh, it's correct. So I got an old copy. All right. So uh, leave it alone then. Mine says Romans through Philippians. So it has been corrected already. And those are Paul's letters. Now, Hebrews through Jude are called general letters. And uh, some people, including me, would put Hebrews in the Paul's letters list. But uh, it's, it probably is more correct to put it in the general letters since he doesn't state who the writer is. But I believe Paul wrote it. Uh, but since there is a question mark there, understand that the general letters are Hebrews through Jude. And then the final book of the, pro of the Bible is the book of prophecy, Revelation. All right. Who wrote the Bible? We believe God wrote the Bible. God used human instruments to record his words. Now. If you believe that God exists, you believe that as a matter of faith because that's the way God wants it. Now, there's plenty of evidence to back up your faith. It's not blind faith. It is very well-grounded faith. And I've got a book in my library somebody gave me. It says, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And I agree with that, that it takes far more, if you want to call faith just in the general sense, not the God sense, but the general sense of a leap of faith, it takes a far greater leap of faith in the dark to, to be an atheist than it takes to, be a, uh, to have faith in the light of the evidences of God. Now, the same is true about the Bible. You say, well, we believe God wrote the Bible. Speak for yourself. I am speaking for myself. And you've got to speak for yourself too. It takes an awful lot of nerve 
to look at all the evidence for the authenticity of the Bible and say, ah, I think it's just another book. I, I, that's insane as far as I'm concerned. So my faith is in the clear evidence, the indisputable track record, undeniable track record of the Bible that God wrote it. God used human instruments to record his words. Let's look at two verses in the Bible that say that. First, uh, Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Inspiration is uh, the word inspired means God breathed. That's the literal meaning of inspired. God breathed. So all scripture is God breathed. 2 Peter 121, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Bible claims that it was given to man from God by his Holy Ghost to men who were the writers. And you say, well, am I supposed to believe it just because it claims to be that? No, but that's the basis for believing that. We didn't just make that up. The Bible itself, the book with this incredible track record, claims that it was given to man by God through holy men by the process of inspiration. Notice the next paragraph. Over the course of about 1,600 years, God moved 40 different men as ink pens. Now, let me stop and explain that phrase. That is largely a southern phrase. Do you know why? Because in the South, when they say pen, you don't know if they're saying P-E-N or P-I-N. Now, this is the way it was explained to me. I didn't make this up. But a Southerner, I said to a Southerner one time, why do you say ink pen? And they said, because when I say pen, what am I saying? And I said, oh, good point. So they say ink pen. It would be easier just to talk English, in my opinion. But anyway... So they say uh, ink pen, so that you know he's, he's talking about uh, this right here. This is my pen. This is my ink pen, all right? So, uh, and this was, <laughs> the author of this book is a southerner. Uh, the editor is not, but he let it get in there anyway. Uh, God moved 40 different men as ink pens to write his words from heaven. A pen does not choose the contents of a letter, but the author who is moving the pen chooses the words. The pen just records onto the page what the author desires. We believe that God has inspired and preserved his word for English-speaking people in the King James Version of the Bible. Now, yeah, if you say, I, I don't agree with that, that is, that is your uh, option to disagree, and I don't think you're a bad Christian if you disagree. But I believe wholeheartedly that God has preserved his word, and we're not getting into preservation tonight, but uh, that is where I stand. Page number four. When was the Bible written? Number one, the word of God existed in heaven before the world began. Wow. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So this book was already established word for word in heaven before God ever created the earth and created man. Number two, the word of God is eternal and will never fade away. So it's always been in heaven forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And it's eternal, it will never fade away. Matthew 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. 1 Peter 1.23, by the word of God which liveth and abideth, it abides, it remains forever. And it's essential, if you're going to take God at his word, it's essential that you understand that this is not a really nice temporary book. I've got a library full of really nice temporary books, but this is different than all of those books in my library. You can burn this book and you won't get rid of it. 
You could get rid of, rid of every, if it were possible, rid of every physical copy and every digital copy on the planet. You still would not have destroyed it. There are many, many books that have been written and destroyed. You'll never get another copy of them. There are many, many books that for some reason are not reprinted. They are so rare. Brother Lapina told me last week about a book by uh, J. Edwin Orr called The Flaming Tongue. It's a book about the history of revivals. When somebody tells me about a book that, like that, he was just saying, he's, man, it's an awesome book, one of the best books I've ever read. We were standing in the, uh, uh, by the foundation of the Baptist Church of Danbury, the, the uh, First Baptist Church of Danbury, when he told me. And I thought, man, I'm going to run home and get me a copy of that. I went home and found out that for some reason it's not reprinted. It's not, you can't find it online in PDF format, which is my, always my backup if I can't find a reprint. All that's left is a couple of original copies. And f uh, for a paperback, they sell for $80, $90, $100. I don't know why. Except that they're so rare and it's such a good book. I don't know why it's not reprinted. But it's possible for a book to be that rare. And it's, it's some books, it's impossible. You'll never see them again. Because they were destroyed and there are no existing copies. But you could destroy every printed copy and every digital copy of the Bible. And you would still not wipe it out. There's a passage in the book of Jeremiah. God gave it to Jeremiah to give to the king of Judah. And the king of Judah took it and page by page cut it up and threw it in the fire. So God gave Jeremiah another copy. Word for word. Why? Because man doesn't have the copy. If we would understand that the preservation of this book is not in the hands of men, it's God's job. So we can sit and talk about, well, you know, the guys that uh, uh, did this or that or copied, they were whatever, they believed this. It doesn't matter. God's in charge. God was in charge of the inspiration. God's in charge of the preservation. And like creation, like the existence of God, like anything, the miracles of the Bible, you choose whether you're going to believe it or not. But God said, his word is forever settled in heaven. It's an eternal book. Heaven and earth could pass away, but his words won't. And his word lives and abides forever. You're not going to wipe this book out. He's, he's taking care of it. So what can the Bible do for me? Number one, it shows me how to get to heaven from here. 2 Timothy 3.15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then John 14, 6, we all know, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How do we know these things from the scriptures? It shows us how to get to heaven. Secondly, it shows me how to live after I know that I am going to heaven. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So the abundant life you learn to live through the words of Jesus Christ. It shows me how to live after I know I'm going to heaven. Thirdly, it gives me spiritual understanding. Psalm 119 verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. That's the power of your, by the way, did you read it today? Did you take the time this morning to open it up and to let it fill your soul? So I, you know, I only had, I don't have much time. I know, you know, as a, as a full-time pastor, I have a lot more time to read the Bible than you do. But in the days when I didn't, when I was working a 40-hour job and taking 18 hours a week classes and working on the bus route in Chicago all weekend long, I found that Five minutes is better than no minutes. I found that writing one verse down on a card and carrying that card with me all day and letting it flow through my head, I'd have a whole lot better day than if I ignored God's word altogether. This book has power. God's words have power. It gives me spiritual understanding. Number four, it shows me what is right. 2 Timothy 4, 16. All, um, 2 Timothy 3. Uh, 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction 
in righteousness. Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 10, and we'll look at that. While you're turning, I love this, this uh, little paragraph underneath explaining about doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Doctrine means what is right. Reproof shows what is not right. Correction shows me how to get right, and instruction in righteousness helps me to stay right, and uh, that's excellent. Why should I read the Bible, all right? First of all, the Bible, the Word of God, will increase my faith. Faith is a real commodity. You either have it or you don't. You may have it and have small uh, quantities of it, but Jesus said, when the disciples said, hey, increase our faith, he essentially said, "Uh, I can't increase what you don't have. He said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Well, he was telling them, you don't need more of what you got. You need something you don't got. And faith is a very real commodity. We talked about four, uh, before, do you trust God? And faith, I, I need faith, you need faith. I need to face each day knowing that I can trust the Lord. He's going he's gonna to keep his word. He's going to take me where he wants me to go. Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. My faith grows as I hear and understand and follow God's words. As my faith increases, I become obedient to his word. No doubt there are people who don't accept the power of God's word. You know who they are? They are the ones who don't invest in the Bible. You've got to make an investment. You've got, the Bible said, buy the truth and sell it not. If you want the truth in your life, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you some time. It's going to cost you some thinking. I've got to employ my brain here if I'm going to get this. The words of God, page six in my book, I don't know if yours is exactly the same, but the words of God are spiritual food. Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The words of God feed my spiritual hunger. As my physical appetite requires me to eat often, so my spiritual appetite seeks to spend time in his word. Hey, Christian, is something lacking in your life? How's your relationship with the Bible? Those are the two places I'd look if something's lacking in your, in your life, if you have a hunger that you see. They may say, I know I'm saved, but there's a void. First two places I'd look is your prayer life and your Bible life. I don't mean, did you read your Bible and pray, be a good boy? I don't mean that. I mean, is your soul feeding on the word of God? Feeding. Not check, 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 read the chapter, chapter, chapter. I don't mean that. I mean, did you open your Bible and consume it? Take something in. Dwell on one verse until it, until it moved your heart, until it made your, your, your heart burn. And then the second place I would tell you to go would be prayer. Again, not just reading through a list, but do you go into God's presence, worship him, commune with him, and bring your petitions to him? How about if you're feeling emptiness, you go to the Lord and tell him that? Lord, I know I'm saved, but there's such an emptiness in my heart. I don't know what it is. Would you show me? By the way, when you ask him that, Pay attention to the words, the the verses, the scripture verses that come to mind right after you ask him that. Lord, show me. And all of a sudden, God brings a verse to mind that you heard, and you have to look it up and find out where it's fine and dwell there for a little while. God's answering your prayer. He he put a, a, a scripture on your heart. The word of God is spiritual food. Number three, God's word gives me examples by which to live. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Number four, and you can turn to Romans 15 if you're still in the book of Romans, just a couple of pages over. Romans chapter 15, we'll read verse 4. The Bible gives me knowledge, wisdom, comfort, and hope. Chapter 15, verse 4. 
For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. The Bible is such a rich, powerful, spiritual book. And it's not going to help you if you if you don't read it, obviously, or if you just read it like you, you know, I don't know if anybody reads a newspaper anymore regularly, but wherever you check for news, you're just looking for the headlines, just looking for, oh, nothing really exciting there, so forget it. No, you've got to go to the Bible with the faith that God has something for you today. God has something for you personally today. And it, God will use it to give you knowledge, wisdom, comfort, and hope. What should be my relationship with the word of God? John 6, 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Five statements here, and I urge you, encourage you to look these verses up yourself later. I should love it. I should read it. I should study it. I should meditate on it, letting it roll through your mind and heart. And meditation implies memorization because you how can you call up a verse that's not already in your heart and and number five i should obey it deuteronomy 13 verse 4 my relationship with the word of god is built by doing these things it takes action it takes action you've seen those peloton commercials where you got somebody on a screen screaming at you say come on keep running Keep going. You're almost there. You can do that. Do you know that's what the Holy Spirit does for you? Come on. Open up. Open up that Bible. Oh, hey. Ten minutes in the Bible is more important than ten more minutes of sleep. Get that Bible out. Get in there. Read it. Hey, memorize those verses. And hey, look, if you've said no long enough, you've quenched the Spirit, and you probably don't hear that voice so loud anymore. But if you want everything that God has for you, just go ahead and do it anyway. Open up the Bible. Read that passage. If, if, if you're like in a total spiritual wasteland right now, let me tell you where to start. I mean, it's a great starting place. Tomorrow morning, May the 19th, open your Bible to Proverbs 19. Start there. But please don't be content to do nothing. And then if you're going to be content to do nothing, please don't go around saying, well, I'm trying that Christian ain't and it didn't work. No, you didn't work. You, you refused to. It take, hey, it takes effort. Having a gym membership is not going to make you more fit if you don't go. And being saved is not going to make you spiritually strong if you don't go. Last question. Is it the last question? I think it's getting down to the last question. Yeah. Can I trust my Bible? Number one, yes. <laughs> okay, good. Number two, yes. Anyway, number one, yes, the Word of God is inspired by God. We read this, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. By the way, you could be turning to Psalm 19 while I'm talking. And if you can turn and follow along at the same time, that way you'll be there when I get there, Psalm 19, actually I'm turning, so we'll arrive about the same time. Um, the Word of God is inspired by God. God breathes. God, and by the way, you say, well, what if somebody was writing down the words and they didn't hear them right? First of all, I don't believe that that's, that, that's the way it happened, like a secretary, you know, God talking and David saying, well, well hold on, I didn't get all that. I, I don't believe that. I believe that God made sure that his writers wrote what he wanted. I think, and this is my opinion, I don't have any scripture for it, but my opinion is I'm not sure they always knew they were written under, writing under inspiration. But when they got done, God said, that's exactly what I wanted, and now I'm going to use it. I could be wrong about that. Either way, I know that they wrote exactly what God wanted written, and he made sure of it. All scripture is given by inspiration. So the word of God is inspired can I trust my Bible? Yes. 
The word of God is pure, so I can trust it. It's Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. Psalm 119, verse 140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Psalm 19, verses 7, 8, and 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Do these promises about being pure and true and righteous and perfect, do they only apply to the words that God inspired? People say, I believe those things are true in the originals. Do you understand that no originals exist anywhere in the world anymore? Nowhere. They're all gone. So if these promises are accurate, God's words still have to be available somewhere. And we're going to have a version debate tonight, but I want you to understand that God promises that his word is pure and true and trustworthy. Can I trust my Bible? Number three, yes, God promises to preserve his words to generations. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Verse, uh, page number eight, 2 Timothy 1, 13, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Each word written by God is true and remains true, for God cannot lie or change. Last point, yes, because its prophecies have been fulfilled throughout history, Acts 3.18. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. And a uh, lot of Lots to think about there tonight, lots to put your faith in tonight because it's straight from the Bible. You didn't see a single point there to, that was not backed up thoroughly with Scripture. And if there was something that you say, well, I don't know, it's a little fuzzy to me, stay on it, stay on it, stay after it in the Bible and let God show you his truth. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's stand together.